boss battles. You may have heard of them. Mike Tyson, Yellow Devil, Soldier wearing a Tyrant's Helm with a Pocket Medic. All of these things are boss fights. But why are they boss fights and not Two Swing Steve? Like what defines a boss? Well, I think I found a good formula for finding this and it involves an allegory. Nano machine, son. You might have heard of this guy before. Played college ball, you know. University of Texas. Could have gone pro if he hadn't joined the Navy. Armstrong for Metal Gear Rising exemplifies the importance of demeanor in a boss fight. Armstrong doesn't just fight the part of a final battle. He acts the part. Fuck all these lipstick lawyers! Fuck this 24-7 internet spew of trivia and celebrity bullshit! They'll make America great again! Armstrong doesn't pull his punches, and that's why he's so great. He is, after all, making, making the mother, mother of all omelets here, Jack. When I say I beat Metal Gear Rising, what I actually mean is I beat everything up until Armstrong, stopped playing for four months, then tried to beat him again. It's been three years since that day. I haven't tried again since. I guess in conclusion, don't fuck with this senator! <laughs> Lots of other bosses have unique demeanors, too. Hello! This is the part where I kill you! Red really isn't grandiose when you pull back the curtain, but imagine being some kid getting to this point and realizing... Ah oh shit, that's me from the first game, cool. Red's implied history is what gives him stake as a boss. That demeanor is what makes you want to overthrow him, and that is what describes the first horseman. So what about the second? By now, someone's probably commented that Armstrong should be war and not conquest because he wanted to start a second 9-11. Well, the Nameless King is literally a god of war, so he best exemplifies the importance of gameplay in a boss fight. He's got plentiful attacks, strong points and weak points, ones that you can strategize around. Like, flailing at his head is easy, but if you time your attacks on his neck, you can do way more damage. And what about depth perception? There's no shadows in this arena, so it's even harder to gauge distance. And there's no safe spot from him because he attacks you from above his bird so you have to position yourself wisely and once you get past that you take him on solo where he really tests your reflexes beating him feels earned and frankly i think nameless king is false advertisement because he was taking names the whole time i fought him you know why tony two tap over here isn't a boss fight because once you learn his movements he's easy to read even when you do learn nameless king's movement knowledge is only half the battle time to go apply yourself 20 more times a good fight tests your critical thinking psycho mantis required you to switch your controller plug glados required clever use of portals monica required you to to delete your game files? Okay. Nameless King brought my squash father down to his final embers, and when I finally won, it felt fucking great. And thus, gameplay holds its stake as the second horseman. Huh? Who's there? What the? A ghost! This literally gave me nightmares as a child. This fight's not even that hard because you just run the whole time, but that's not why he scared me. He looks creepy. He's bloated. His mouth is gaping. Constant, unsettling noises. Some of you might say that he looks dopey, like a haunted toilet. And you're right. But goddammit, I love him too much. King Boom Boo represents the importance of appearance in a boss fight. A good boss design screams. <laughs> Phallus, Egg Golem, and the Savior are monumental. Or Gigas, because what's a childhood without a little trauma? Or Flowey, because- No! No! Through the Fire and the Flames exemplifies the importance of a soundtrack in a boss fight. And trust me, this song is a boss fight. And I chose it for famine because, well, because I was running out of ideas. A final boss is only as great as their theme song. If it doesn't contain at least three drum sets and two distorted electric guitars, it's not a boss fight theme. A good theme can reflect the personality of a boss. Abyss Watchers have such a tragic history. They lost their purpose and went mad fighting each other endlessly. So a tragic theme is fitting. Snatcher is chaotic and wild. He spends the entire stage ordering you around and goofing off. So his theme is totally hectic and loud. King K. Rule is... I got nothing. These are the four pieces to a great boss fight. Every great boss implores some level of each of these. But to be honest with you, there's a fifth horseman, one that I haven't talked about.
The fifth horseman is Providence. Or in our case, expectations. For example, you probably didn't expect me to add a fifth horseman. Boom, subverted. I chose the Guardian 8 for apparent reasons. At first glance, he's pretty primitive. Attacks wildly and, well, like a scientist. scientist. But decapitate him and you'll find that he's surprisingly a very adept swordsman. His movements are even more erratic now, but his attacks are even more precise. Where before you just had to evade an attack, now you have to deflect an attack. So not only were you unprepared for a second phase, you're unprepared for an entirely new attack pattern. And this is the beauty of expectations. Luring players into that false sense of security and then hitting them with the, oh, by the way, you're not even halfway done with this. From Software is really good at this. Health bars almost mean nothing half the time because there's usually a hidden phase right after it. Congrats, you beat the Abyss Watchers. Fuck you. You're halfway done with Pontiff Sullivan, man. By the way, he has a stand now. When this happens, everybody thinks, Oh God, it's not over. But conversely, when you finally win, you have that moment. Got him. By the way, there's a centipede inside the monkey. Didn't expect that. These are the five horsemen of great boss battles. So now, let's talk about bad boss battles. Grunt rushes aren't boss fights. Boss rushes aren't boss fights. In speaking of Devil May Cry 4, giant bosses aren't fun when their entire gimmick is just running up and slapping a weak spot. Bed of Chaos is so goddamn frustrating because she attacks you from above, but the floors break below you, which means you can't focus on both at the same time, and you're 50% blind the entire fight. Alduin, a final boss built up so much throughout Skyrim, pretty much amounts to- So if we know the best and the worst of boss battles, then what's in the middle? A big daddy may as well be a real boss, but it's technically not. The circumstance of your encounter varies greatly, and fighting isn't usually necessary. They serve as more of a high-level grunt than they do a boss. They look cool, and they're harder to fight, but that's about it. Another one I like is the Chained Ogre in Sekiro. Technically, I didn't touch the ground there. That doesn't count. I didn't... Oh! This is an early game mini boss who, again, may as well be a full boss for all that he can do. And he teaches players to be aware of their surroundings. If you don't clear all the guards nearby, it's gonna be a bitch fighting this ogre. Lots of Sekiro's mini bosses follow this trend. Oftentimes, you can sneak a life bar off of them before fighting. This rewards patient players, making mini bosses a great learning tool. But at the same time, this ogre leaves very little implication on the story, and his fight isn't that memorable beyond the roadblock. So a mini boss is about as good as you can put it. So in conclusion, I want to use my five examples here to calculate the best boss of all time. One with personality, difficulty, an iconic appearance, a memorable soundtrack, and a challenge to your preconceptions. Sandy! Robot Sandy from Battle for Bikini Bottom! You got that elbow drop attack? Oh shit! The again. So